What's up, everybody? It's Svant here. Uh, I wanted to make a video giving you guys my full BlizzCon story, my full BlizzCon experience, uh, and also giving you my thoughts, my opinions on the classic news and, and the current state of things. Uh, I do feel like my BlizzCon experience was something that was, uh, was a very unique experience, uh, just given my history, the, the kind of the state of classic right now, and uh, also kind of the history with the vanilla community, right? Uh, so yeah, let's let's just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, myself, stay safe. Tips. We all got the chance to go to BlizzCon uh, with media passes. Actually, we all got media passes to BlizzCon, which kind of gave us exclusive access to certain things. Uh, I got the chance to IRL stream there. Uh, but for me personally, it didn't actually stop there. They also gave me the opportunity to IRL stream at BlizzCon. So those of you guys who uh, who, who don't watch my streams, maybe that was that was a pretty unreal i mean it, it, it was unreal that we got media passes like that was so cool in, in and of itself but uh to, to get invited to stream like that was i, I mean I, I never never in a million years would have thought that so I keep smacking my mic i'm sorry but they they invited me to stream uh so i so i got an opportunity to stream classic at blizzcon one year almost exactly one year after i got banned for for streaming classic on youtube right for streaming private servers so it, that, that was a pretty surreal experience and um, getting to do all that was nuts, but I, I kind of want to go through, I'll go through the entire timeline of what we did. And, uh, I, I really want to spend the bulk of this video talking more about, uh, talking, talking a little bit more about the classic news, but that first night we came in, there was a lot going on. Uh, it's actually the night before BlizzCon. I got a chance to meet a lot of people, got a chance to meet Chinglish. Chinglish is, is somebody who's been incredibly supportive from the very beginning. He used to watch my old YouTube streams. Uh, Bajira was another guy we got to meet. And uh, another guy who used to watch my YouTube streams and stuff. And, you know, we, we it was so cool to get to go there and to, to meet all these people that you've made friends with, that, that you've gotten to know. And uh, whether whether you've already been friends with them or you've already met them before, you're, you're meeting them for the first time. Right. So, I mean, those, those are just examples of two guys. But like getting to see Crom again, getting to, to meet Aladar for the first time, Savix Clack. All these guys, there, there's so many. I don't want to go into it so much, but it, it's just such a cool experience to get to hang out with the friends in real life with the friends that you've made online. So that, that was something that was really special. Uh, we got to go to the wowhead party and the first night is, is, is a lot of fun, right? It's just, it's just kind of hanging out, doing whatever. The second day is kind of where, uh, things really got rolling the first day of BlizzCon, the second day, AKA the first day of BlizzCon. So when the day started out, I went ahead and I went in and I, I was allowed to IRL stream because I had a, I had a media pass and I had, I had like special permission to, to IRL stream from inside the convention center. So, because I was IRL streaming, and I think I was the only IRL stream that was streaming BlizzCon. I think I was the only person with a backpack in there who was able to stream. So I was streaming BlizzCon, and, and that was unreal. Doing IRL with everybody. With uh, you know, we met up with Asmin. Uh, I actually think I had the first classic footage on Twitch because I went into the playtest area and I propped up a camera and I logged into Classic and I was playing, and they kicked me out. <laughs> so I, you know, I had like. I, I think I had 5,000 viewers whenever I walked into the playtest area, and by the time I sat up and I logged in, I had 7,000 viewers, which is insane. But uh, but yeah, they kicked me out of there. So I, I went ahead and went the whole day streaming. We ended up peaking at 10,000 viewers, which is un like having having a 10,000 viewer IRL stream is unreal. Um, so you know ha having everybody there, Zach Minkle, Revy, Asman, all, all those guys was just super cool. Um, after that is whenever I got to stream at BlizzCon. I thought maybe whenever I was like, you know, streaming on, on the floor at BlizzCon, I thought maybe I'd have like 3,000 viewers. Asmund said he thought I would have like five. And I ended up having 12,500 viewers streaming Classic. And the only person that I, I was told, I, I don't know if this is true, I was told the only person that was streaming there, um, streaming at BlizzCon, had was Shroud, actually. And he, he was the only other person who had more than me with 25. And then I had 12,500 with Soda popping online. He was streaming from the Twitch offices with like 45K, which is, I mean, that's, that's totally insane. I, I never, never could have imagined uh, having something like that happen. But right before, this is where it gets interesting, guys. Right before I went on, I uh, somebody sent me the clip of the sharding from Preach's stream, actually, from Preach's stream. And I was like, what the hell? Like, what, like, what the hell is this? Right. And everybody thought it was phasing or whatever. Uh, but I saw that literally right before I went on. So I'm on my stream and I'm doing my thing. And uh, people are like, well, what about the sharding? What about the sharding? And I didn't see any sharding because the, the BlizzCon client is different than that home client. Like it's just on different servers. I think everybody who was playing at BlizzCon was playing together. So 
I didn't personally get to see any sharding, but that was just one of those things. Like, you know, I saw the video and I was like, this is, this doesn't make any sense, right? This isn't right. But the first thing I ended up doing after I got off my stream is I went over to a couple of Blizzard employees and I told them, <laughs> I was like, Hey, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't experience it firsthand, but a lot of people are saying like they're noticing sharding in, in the demo at home and they're, uh, people are a little bit upset about this. People are a little bit worried about this. I mean, this is something that's, it's not classic, uh, kind of trying to give my feedback as soon as I could. Right. And what they told me is, uh, they know they, they, they've heard people's feedback. They've, they've been following along with people. So it, it's something that I, I think people were very loud about it. I, I, I didn't think people, I didn't think people were aggressive or, um, out of line or anything, but uh, I, I think that people were, were very vocal, right? People were very vocal about not liking sharding. People still are. And, uh, you know, myself included, like I'm not a fan of sharding at all, but, um, I thought it was cool to get to go there and, and firsthand tell them like, Hey, like this is, uh, this is some like immediate feedback firsthand. So they told me like, you know, this is just something, you know, temporary. We, we, we did this for the demo, whatever. I was like, okay, sure. So out of that, after that, we went, we did a classic cast together with Asmin and with Annie Fuchsia. Uh, that classic cast, you guys saw, it's already uploaded on the YouTube channel. But after that classic cast is whenever uh, we actually met with Omar Gonzalez. Omar Gonzalez is a senior software engineer working on classic. He's worked on the WoW team since 2003. And he, he was the guy who went up after Ian. Uh, during the classic panel he's the guy who went up after ian during the classic panel and uh myself tips and stay safe we went and got drinks with them yeah we went and got drinks with him and his wife and uh just got a chance to kind of like shoot the breeze a little bit hang out talk about classic uh and, and really just ask him some stuff firsthand like what are your guys thoughts here what are your guys thoughts there and uh we got a we got a few interesting like uh things from him basically so we, we learned some things from him <clears throat> One of which is, you know, we, we, we brought up and, and you guys can see this in the uh, you guys can see this in the exclusive interview that we were a part of. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Somebody asked about rebalancing classes and, and we asked them about that, too. It's like, like, did you guys ever like what was your thoughts on like rebalancing classes or anything like that? And we were told that it was never something that's that's even been a consideration for them is to go through and to rebalance old classes or anything, because so much of the game to them is is they want to keep vanilla vanilla as much as they can, right? There's some things they're going to have to do differently, but they want to keep the core of the game the same and um, retain so, so much of what, so much of the game that people want to play, right? People want to play vanilla. They don't want to play something else. And that's the whole point. So uh, I thought that was really cool. We also learned from Omar that he said that whenever they're making decisions, they're trying to make decisions uh, for the long term. And, you know, what does the long term mean? And then he followed that up with, He's like, well, 10, 12, 15 years. So, I mean, he was, you know, he was just saying some numbers, right? But whenever he uses numbers uh, of that magnitude, right? Whenever we're talking about WoW, WoW's been around for 14 years. WoW's been around for almost 15. So um, that kind of gave us the impression, that gave us the impression that, you know, this is, uh, with them doing classic, they're committed to this thing for the long haul. Uh, we're talking potentially fresh servers. We'll talk, we're talking expansions. Uh, so I think that was just something interesting that he said that I'm inferring. Uh, I think, I think, you know, all three of us would infer that this is something that they want to do in the long term, And, um, there is potential of like fresh servers after a cycle of classic potential of expansions after a cycle of classic and so on. The next day, Actually, was that? Yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. That was pretty much it. The next day, uh, we were up pretty late. So we pretty much got up and, and immediately, like as soon as we got up, got ready, go to the convention center. We we met with, we, we got to be a part of an exclusive group interview. And that video is posted on my YouTube channel. Some of you guys may have already seen it. Many of you have actually probably already seen it. But I went ahead and recorded that interview. And that was with Brian Birmingham, who is the lead software engineer for classic and with John Height, who was the executive, he's the new executive producer for wow. He has Jalen Brack's old job. So that's who was there. Uh, they seem very enthusiastic about wow. Brian has worked on the wow team since 2006. John, I think has been on for seven or eight years. So he wasn't around for classic. Um, 
but we got a chance to talk to him after the fact. We got a chance to talk to him one on one after um, after that that kind of group interview press conference thing. And he said he had been a, he had been a fan of WoW for like a long time before he even started working for Blizzard. So uh, that was cool to hear. Uh, that was cool to hear. And whenever we talked to him, uh, this is an interesting little tidbit that that we got from him. But talked to him a little bit about kind of like how uh, as as the as part of the classic community, as part of the vanilla community, we have kind of felt uh, in the dark for a long time, right? Uh, especially with the you know. You, you think you do, but you don't think. And I, I know it was it like it's something that it's kind of like water under the bridge now to, for the most part, because it's like, look, it doesn't even matter anymore because we're getting classic, whatever. But that was like one of those things that that was one of those things that kind of solidified that like, oh, well, we're not getting classic. Right. Like, we're not going to get legacy servers. That's that's not something that we're going to get. Uh, people just kind of felt like. Like, I mean, literally, like I said, we're in the dark. There, there's no news. We don't know what's going on. Uh, and it's still like it still kind of feels that way. I mean, at least until now where they're finally like starting to push out more news about classic. Uh, and I just, I mean, I thanked him. I said, Hey, look, like this is something that is an incredible opportunity. I mean, you guys, you know, choosing us, I guess, to, to give us media passes and get a chance to come talk to you guys one-on-one -on -one and um, really, really give you guys some feedback and, and uh, kind of share our concerns and our thoughts with you guys. <clears throat> and he told me, he's like, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's something that, like, we really appreciate. We really appreciate the honesty just, you know, coming out, like, outright and just being like, hey, like, this is this is what we want, right? This is this is what people want. This is what the community wants. Um, so they're, they're looking at feedback from the community. And I, I think having that kind of line of communication established with them uh, is something that I think is really cool. I think it's big just because, I mean, at, at least we know that they hear us, right? Because at least we know, like, whenever we talk, like, hey, like, we're not a fan of sharding. We're not a fan of loot trading. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit in, in a little while. Um, we at least know that like, Hey, like it, the, the, it, we're not, we're not yelling into like an, an, uh, into an empty vase or something like we're, we're telling it to somebody. Um, so that's something cool. That's something, that's something that I felt really good about. And I told them one of the most exciting things about classic coming out this summer is that, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully get a, a beta or alpha soon. And, you know, he, you know, jokingly, he's like, yeah, Blizzard soon, right? Um, I mean, Blizzard soon, right? Soon, quote. But pretty much confirmed that, yes, there's going to be a, a beta or alpha period. There's going to be a, there is going to be an open testing period. And I think that's probably going to come around the end of the year. I think that's probably going to come maybe late December, early January sometime. I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but that, that would just be my guess. I think that would be good timing. Uh, having the beta come out then or the alpha or whatever, and maybe a beta period after that. Or uh, Whenever I say alpha or beta, I usually use them interchangeably, but an open testing period or, or a, a uh, extended, a, an extended testing period. I think that's going to start early next year or the end of next or the end of this year. Uh, so I thought that was cool. I mean, he all but confirmed it. That was nice. Um, after that is whenever we went to the classic panel, almost directly from there, we went straight to the classic panel and the classic panel. Hmm. We'll kind of run through this, and I'm going to come back to the classic panel. Actually, I'm going to run through this, and we'll come back to the classic panel. But um, you know, we we did the classic panel. I, I I had my thoughts on this, and like I was, I I, I was kind of hot after the classic panel. Like I, I I really do not like the concept of loot trading. I think that uh, even like wait, from the perspective of of me as a streamer, that's something that like you know I could go into a group. And I could have, you know, two, two other people who watch my stream in my group. And then we're playing against two other people or not playing against kind of playing against, but playing with two other people. And we can all roll on an item that I need. And I essentially get like three rolls for a chance at one item versus one other guy. And then what would be like a 50, 50 split turns into like a 75, 50 or 75, 25 split. Um, that's just one example of the, the potential for loot trading abuse. And, uh, I, I do have a, a solution for it. Like some, you know, I, I, and I, I've seen, I, I have an idea. I have an idea for this, but I want to get into it a little bit later. Uh, so we did a classic cast after that. And again, I, I was kind of, like I said, I was kind of, you know, for me, for S fan, I was kind of hot. Cause I was just like, this is absurd. Like, I don't, I don't see why, like why they thought this was a good idea or whatever. Cause it's just, it's so not classic, but continuing on. And this was probably, this was probably the coolest part of BlizzCon for me was I was walking, we were walking back 
from the convention center. We were going somewhere. I can't remember where we were going, but we were going somewhere. Oh, I think we were going to eat. But uh, we were, I was walking with Aladar, and I was walking with Maral. And Maral, she had to use a restroom. So she was like, okay, we were like right in between two hotels. And it just doesn't matter. You can go to whatever hotel. So she's like, oh, I'll just go to this one. So she goes to that hotel, and we're like, okay, well, I'll just follow, and we'll just hang out in the lobby. We go into the lobby, Aladar and I do, and we see Ian Hazakostis, actually. We see Ian Hazakostis there, and I was like, oh, that's crazy. <clears throat> I was like, yeah, that's crazy. No, I, I was like, ah, oh, that's crazy. Okay, so he, he was, I, I guess he was walking, he just ended a conversation, he was walking by, and I, and I grab him, I'm like, hey, Ian, just, you know, just want to introduce myself, say hi, um, just kind of like, you know, just let him know, like, hey, I, I think I think what you're doing is cool. I mean, you, you started out as a hardcore raider, hardcore raider. Uh, you know, you were leading elitist jerks and all this stuff, and, and now you're, you're game director. I mean, that's, that's something that's pretty awesome, and you know, I, I immediately went like vanilla brain activated after that. And I just started like spouting off like, well, by the way, uh, I didn't like this and I didn't like this and I didn't like this about the classic panel. So, so like it wasn't, it wasn't weird or anything, but like, I just like, I, I told them, I told them straight up. I told them straight up. I was like, Hey, like, you know, while I have you here, can I like, can I ask you some stuff about like the, the decisions that you make about the decisions that you guys, the decisions that you guys made, um, uh, about classic, right. You know, that you guys were talking about in the panel and, um, he he gave me he gave me a little bit of insight. Uh, I mean, I, I I understand a little bit better why they, they made some of the decisions that they made. Uh, and I've said this before. I, I think that was probably the highlight of the night for me because, or the the weekend because I had 10k viewers doing IRL. I had 12 and a half k streaming classic at BlizzCon. But getting the opportunity to talk to Ian Hazakostis and whenever he was speaking to me, it was very real. It wasn't like a scripted like talking head on a stage it wasn't like he was reading off of, he was like hey like I, I'm, I'm talking to you like as a gamer now he's, he's obviously very well spoken he's a lawyer and all this stuff but it felt like he, he was like leveling with me which uh i thought was really cool uh i thought that was really cool actually but um but yeah you know i, I asked him specifically about uh how they did some of the phases uh, the, the idea behind the debuff slots, the debuff slot it, it thing is, is so low on my, my list of issues because there's, there's other things that are, uh, a much bigger deal to me than the debuff slot thing. And, and we had kind of prepared ourselves for, I, I had thought that they would probably just come out with 16 debuff slots. I mean, I, I think a lot of people had prepared themselves for that. Um, but that's not, that's not something that's, that's as high up on the list to me as, as, uh, how they're doing the phased content and the sharding and all this stuff. Uh, the loot trading, of course. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I got a chance the next morning to go get breakfast with a blizzard employee. Uh, I had a chance the next morning, to go get breakfast with a blizzard employee. And I told him pretty much everything that, that I'm going to tell you guys now. So, uh, I, I just, I just gave him like, you know, open, honest feedback. Just let him know exactly how I feel everything. And <clears throat> there was some good. There was some good. Actually, I, I will say there's a lot of good. But the problem with the good that we heard out of, uh, as far as classic news goes, out of the classic panel, is that it was everything that we kind of expected. Like, no dungeon finder. Yeah, no crap. No cross realm, of course. No achievements, no flying. Like, obviously, right? Like, this, this is things that, like, they weren't even... Maybe maybe for for the people that that don't follow the classic news so closely, this is something that that would be a question. But for the people that uh, are are very much like into the scene and and following the, I mean just just following everything so far. I mean they've already said like you know they're they're committed to to the core of the game at one point twelve and all this stuff. Like it just wasn't even a consideration. Um, so they kind of confirm stuff that is good. It's important. It's important that those things are true, and we know that it's true. But it's not exciting because. We we already thought that we were gonna do that, um, but that was good. The design philosophy is good. They want to deliver an authentic experience, uh, emphasis on integrity of social dynamics. I remember them saying that, and then um, they don't really want to mess with like 1.12 as far as like uh, they, they want to keep 1.12, 1.12 as much as possible. Um, also, the team I kind of talked about the team a little bit earlier, but Brian Birmingham, Brian Birmingham, the lead uh, lead software engineer, started in 2006. Uh, Omar Gonzalez, senior software engineer, uh, Ian Hazakosis, of course, is game director. He, I mean, so, okay. So this is something that was interesting. I thought that they were going to have two separate teams for classic and for, for BFA for retail. And as it turns out, it's not two separate teams, but it's, it's like classic is basically like a sub team 
of part of the greater WoW team, right? So I don't I don't know who all else was involved. These these are the only like devs that I know, um, but I do know that Brian and Omar went from like the greater WoW team to the classic team, and they're kind of like running the show there, and they still have like Ian as a reference point. I mean, somebody, he was a hardcore raider, elitist jerks, all that stuff. And, and then John Hyde is executive producer for wow. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure he's still involved, but uh, if I, if I had to assume I could be wrong, but if I had to assume, I, I, I would say that's it's probably Brian and, and Ian and Omar are kind of the ones doing a lot of the nitty gritty type stuff. So as far as classic goes, <clears throat> so I thought that was cool. I thought that was cool. I, I was, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I was excited to hear that they had original vanilla WoW devs kind of running the show on uh, as far as classic goes. So let's get into let's get into the bad. And this is this is what I told like during breakfast whenever I was kind of explaining my opinions on like, you know, kind of kind of explaining my experience and talking about like, hey, this is what I like. This is what I didn't like. I thought that they would do phased content release. And I was actually talking about it for a few weeks on my streams prior to BlizzCon. I thought that it was, uh, it was, it, it kind of hinged on how they wanted to treat itemization as far as progressive itemization goes. And I thought if they didn't want to do true progressive itemization, then doing phased content release is something that we could probably see. And what I mean by phased content release is that they would release content in blocks and not actually go through a true patch progression uh, as far as itemization uh, and and like PVE content goes, PVP stuff. I thought they would do phases and um, if they if they weren't going to do a true progressive itemization. So <clears throat> I think the fact that they did propose phases means that they probably aren't going to do like 100% true progressive itemization. And I've made a video about progressive itemization in the past few months ago. It's, it's still on my YouTube channel somewhere. Uh, but I think that on the topic of progressive itemization, a lot of people present it as one thing when in reality, progressive itemization has different parts. There's, uh, there's when items are upgraded, there's when items are put into the game and when items are taken out of the game. Uh, those are, those are three parts to progressive itemization. I think some parts are more important than others. If you look back on Nostalrius, for example, uh, Nostalrius had the 1.9 updated stats for the tier two sets whenever the tier two sets were released in 1.6 a lot of people didn't even know like a lot of a lot of the player base didn't even know that there was uh six seven eight patch 1.6 1.7 1.8 where the tier three excuse me the tier two stats were very different and speaking to paladins i mean i do that a lot because that's that's my main um the judgment set was like a, a really strong PVP healing set for about three patches. And then in the 1.9 patches, whenever it changed to more of a spell power set, uh, that's whenever you saw like some of the shock and stuff and whatnot. And you, I mean, you saw some shock and stuff beforehand, but <clears throat> spell power plate became a thing in the game uh, in the 1.9 patch. And, and the judgment set was a big part of that. So I think as far as importance goes, I think items that, are put in the game and then taken out of the game. Again, let's talk about tier two. Tier two was put in in Molten Core, uh, and then it was taken out except for the helmet off of Anixia and the legs off of Rag. Excuse me. So, something like that, it would be cool. I, I would I, I would love to, to get the opportunity to go through and grab my tier two before the stats got changed and all this stuff, and the judgment set was like a really strong ret set. I mean, it would have been cool, right? But, um... Uh, the reality of it is, and, and I, I really would have liked to see that in the past, uh, but the reality of it is, is that if they don't do that, and, and there's a reason that none of the private servers did that as well. Uh, I say none of, but, but the Nost Core private servers. Um, they didn't put the tier two in at the beginning and then take it out with the old stats. So that's not as big of a deal. I think the biggest deal whenever it comes to itemization is putting in strong items or updating the stats of items that become very strong, uh, such as the Savage Gladiators chain from BRD, like the chess piece. Um, stuff like that, that's an upgrade. An item that's put into the game, Titanic leg plates, for example, and that's a 1.10 patch. That's the second best plate DPS legs in the game. This kind of stuff should not be in the game from the beginning. Um, Savage Gladiators chain is comparable with AQ40 gear, patch 1.9 chess piece. 
Um, the uh, the Titanic leg plates are comparable with, well, they're just better than everything except for the uh, the leg plates off of Hygen. I think they I think they drop off of Hygen. The uh, leg plates of Carnage. So second best plate DPS. So if, if you have stuff like this in the game, items like this in the game really early on, uh, not only does it affect the it affects the game in a negative manner because you're putting it hurts your gear progression because you're getting some of the best stuff right at the beginning over over the course of what should be like two years. Uh, you're instead you're getting it almost right off the bat. Titanic leg plates. It's a BOE world drop pattern that you you learn it. You blacksmith it. You make the legs, and then all of a sudden people are selling these legs all over the place, and you don't upgrade them until Nax. It, it seems kind of silly. I think that's harmful for the game. I don't think that's good. Uh, and there's a lot of other items as well. They added, like, a, a lot of people call them, like, the Nax Blues, the, the, the Nax Patch Blue. Actually, I think it was right before the Nax Patch. I think it was 1.10 uh, that they added in, like, Heart of Warm Thalic and uh, a whole bunch of items in the dungeons to kind of re... Very strong items, by the way, but to kind of uh, re invigorate players to go back and do those five-man dungeons with um, with other players who maybe you're trying to get like their their tier 0 0.5 their dungeon set 2 stuff I think that kind of stuff should be uh, held on to and put in the game later uh, maybe even the new MC loot stuff like that I, I think I think stuff like that's very important in, in regards to progressive itemization so <clears throat> I kind of put together uh, I kind of put together a proposed phased content release schedule this is something that i think uh, i think this would be good and I'll, I'll explain why and i'll go through everything uh kind of in depth i didn't want this video to be that long but i think it's gonna end up being really long so sorry about that guys but um they said that they want the game to release with mc anixia uh mardon Dyrmal, azergos and kazik and well actually hold on let me let me reel it back a little bit and let's talk about this first. They say they want four phases of content. And I think the four phases of content as a core idea behind MC, BWL, AQ, and Nax, that makes sense. But the problem is, is whenever you have to wait so long between that stuff and there's no real progression happening in between, uh, it kinda it kinda hurts the hype. Right, it, it makes it less. It makes it less exciting. If they wanted to, if, if they want to keep people more engaged throughout the course of the uh, throughout the course of vanilla, right, throughout the course of, of a cycle of a classic WoW server, of a WoW classic server, I think it's important to have more phases. Uh, and again, I told this to the Blizzard employee I was having breakfast with. I think it's important for them to have more phases because, uh, like I said, it keeps people engaged. Uh, it's good. It, it's good for the player base because it's more exciting. You have something to do. And I mean, it, even on from their perspective, it keeps people subbed. Uh, Twitch viewership is better, right? Because there's hype. I mean, we know from the private server stuff, right? Whenever I was streaming private servers on on YouTube, I like my viewership would always go up whenever there was some kind of patch. I mean, that's just how it goes because everybody wants to see, oh, what's new in the patch? What's what's going on, right? Uh, I, I think that's that, that's just the nature of it. That's how it goes. The same thing happens in retail. Wow. So I think having four phases of content release is something that's not particularly good. Um, <clears throat> so I think the game should launch with MC, Anixia, and Maradon. I, I think Maradon being in from the start is fine. Uh, the game is a little bit different now, and everybody has kind of said this. like It's not going to be entirely the exact same experience that we had in the past. And this is something interesting that Ian brought up. Uh, whenever I was talking to Ian, it, it kind of came up. He didn't directly say this, but uh, he, he said some things that kind of, to me, I took it as like, they want to recreate as much of the authentic vanilla experience as possible. And that's not quite the same thing as the private server experience. And I'll get into that a little bit more uh, as I go through this. But um, I think that having Dire Mall in at launch, uh, the argument for Dire Mall in at launch is... In Europe, Dyrmal came out about four weeks. Dyrmal came out about four weeks after uh, after the game released. So, realistically, back in 2005 at the time, back in 2005, there was not a big enough player base to have gotten to 60 and to, to be doing Dyrmal and farming it and figuring things out about Dyrmal and this and that. So, <clears throat> because not enough people were really there at the time, 
not enough people were really there by the time that it came out. Why not just put it on release? I think that's the argument for putting Dire Mall in at release. Uh, and and honestly, I, I just I disagree, right? And I think that having Dire Mall in uh, from the beginning allows people who everything is going to be faster now. Everything is going to be faster. People know how to level better. Uh, just uh, just players are better. People are just better gamers. And I think with all the information and knowledge available to us now, uh, having Dire Mall in from launch, especially for the 1% of players who have more vanilla experience and more vanilla knowledge than others, um, it, it, it's really going to separate people hard. If Dire Mall's in from the launch, uh, the world buffs are in the game, all the new spell damage gear is in the game, uh, the different farming spots are in the game for mages, for hunters. <clears throat> And I don't even know how Blizzard's going to treat that, actually, because, you know, for example, on, on, on some of the more recent private servers, they've nerfed a lot of the, the Dire Mall farming for, you know, for mages, for hunters, for whatever, so that so they, they weren't making an absurd amount of gold uh, and, and hurting the economy. So I, I don't know how Blizzard's actually going to treat that. But um, regardless, back to my original point, I do think if Phase 2, Dire Mall, Azergos, and Kazakh... All of these things were in the 1.3 patch. I think if they put out World Bosses and Dire Mall like a month and a half after release, uh, I think that'd be a good. I think that'd be a good move for them because one, you again, you're keeping people engaged. That's that's the whole point of this whole thing. I mean, social interaction, uh, a constant stream of content. I've talked about it before. Vanilla WoW, you you get the feeling of uh, a lot of small wins, right? A lot of small little progressions, and uh, if you can take that and and you you feel like you're progressing through the game throughout these, these patch cycles or uh, this, these phase content cycles, I should say. Uh, I, I think that's just a better environment and a it's just healthier for the game all around. So about a month and a half later, I think they should come out with Dire Maul. Now, now you've added all the spell hit gear, not spell hit gear, spell damage gear. Uh, you've, you've added in uh, everything that Dire Maul has to offer, basically world buffs and, and all that. And uh, you also have Azergos and you have Kazakh. In the game now so you have more hype you have world bosses in the game that's a big hype event a month and a half after classic comes out i think that's that's big that's big that's a lot of hype people are going to be all over that people are going to be watching streams who's going to get the first world bosses on what server and this and that it's going to be great uh i think whenever you have azergos and kazakh in on launch and this was in their their original phase content proposal if you have azergos and kazakh in on launch then they're going to spawn by the time that people have hit level 60. So you end up having a race from the very beginning to get these world bosses that you know are going to be up by the time you're 60, realistically. It's 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 going to be at least by the time enough people are level 60 to be able to kill him. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's particularly good, right? Because it's... Um, I, I I just I just think it's weird. I, I, like, I, don't, I don't think that's something that's particularly good. You, you have too early on the opportunity to get... Uh, Azure Ghost drops the plus 92 healing cloth helmet. Like, I think it's 13 intellect, 14 spirit. I mean, it, it's 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 an amazing... I think it doesn't get replaced until tier, tier 3. It's it's an amazing helmet. You you get this stuff uh, put into the game from the very beginning, and it kind of goes back to the, the concept of progressive itemization, making sure that you're not putting items that are too strong too early in the game, and it's like, well, what's, what's a month and a half difference? It's like, yeah, I mean, I, I understand, right? But you still have to progress through Molten Core and Anixia over the course of that month, month and a half um, without that kind of stuff available to you, without Dire Maul, without world buffs. And um, I just think it's better for the game. I, I just think it's better for the game. More hype uh, makes it a little bit more difficult. Kind of you, you, people have to work a little bit harder to, to get what they need to get. I think a month and a half after that, <clears throat> oh geez, my voice is still going away. I think a month and a half after that, um, this would be at the three month mark is whenever they should put in the honor system. I think that putting the honor, not putting the honor system in at the start. Uh, I think it is a good idea. And, and we've talked about this on classic cast. Stay safe has been big on it. I've been big on it. I think that whenever you put the honor system in from the start, it changes the meta quite a bit. And actually the, the meta is going to be quite different anyway, because you have, you have 16 debuff slots. So you're going to have the opportunity for shadow priest to be in raids. Uh, from early on, so that'll increase your shadow damage a little bit with with warlocks and whatnot. Um, and if they have Dire Maul on launch, if they have Dire Maul on launch, then you're also going to have spell power gear and stuff in the game right from the beginning. Uh, like we'll have more spell spell power gear in right from the beginning, and uh, that's going to make casters 
a, a little bit stronger as well. I think because of like some private server memory and whatnot, I, I think warriors and rogues might be a little bit stronger than they are that they're going to be. Um, specifically, like Fury is giving you an or Flurry is giving you an extra stack whenever um, of, of the attack speed proc for for warriors. I mean that's just one thing. Taunting, sitting, enraged, stuff like that, <clears throat> which is which is uh, not going to be a thing in classic more than likely. Sorry, I'm, I I lose my voice kind of early because my I, I I didn't have my voice for like a whole week at BlizzCon, so so bear with me if I'm if it's getting a little bit rough. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm gonna continue. Uh, I think that putting the I think that putting the honor system in a little bit before Blackwing Layer, they're proposing that you put the honor system and Blackwing Layer in at the same time. Uh, I don't like that uh, in 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 WoW and retail and retail classic WoW and retail vanilla WoW. The honor system came in in the 1.4 patch. The honor system came in in the 1.4 patch. Uh, Warsong and AV were added in 1.5. Clearly, they want to do phased content, and they want to put all the PvP stuff in at the same time. They proposed, I believe it was, all the honor stuff, ZG, uh, BWL. I think it was all the honor stuff, ZG, and BWL at the same time. Uh, I may need to double-check that. But... Um, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good. I think what they should do, and again, you're you're generating hype. You're keeping people engaged. You're keeping people entertained. People are excited for this. Honor system drops three months after release. And with the honor system, if they want to put all the PvP stuff together, okay, put the battle runs in with the honor system, the PvP rewards, everything's in. And then also, what you would do in, in this phase three, three months in, you would also put the new Molten Core loot in. Uh, this would be the patch, the patch 1.4, 1.5 stuff. Um, you would like on. I'm talking about like onslaught girdle, flame guard gauntlets, that kind of gear. Uh, if that stuff's not in from the launch, and uh, you know, like I said before, I, I think I think putting items in at the right time is important. Uh, I think that if that stuff's not in from the launch, that's a perfect time to put it in. Three months in, three months before Blackwing Lair comes out. So three months later. I think that's whenever they should release Blackwing Lair, uh, Darkmoon Fair. I think Blackwing Lair and Darkmoon Fair should come in then. So this is at the six month mark. Six months after release, Blackwing Lair comes out. And then there's also a PvP weapons update. Sorry, I keep smacking my mic. There's also a PvP weapons update. If the honor system comes out at the three month mark and then the Blackwing Lair comes out at the six month mark, then the people who are just hitting Grand Marshal are getting Grand Marshal just in time for Blackwing Lair. And it's going to be a very small number of people. So I don't know if like they would just have the updated weapons in the way they are from the beginning because there's virtually no way that they would get the updated weapons before that patch. I think that, you know, all this, uh, you got you to gotta work with the dates and whatnot. I would just update the weapons whenever BWL hits, is my point. Because, like, I, you know, I'm saying, like, roughly, like, one and a half months, three months, six months. It's all, like, rough, rough numbers, right? Because stuff's not going to be exactly on the day, this and that. Um, and, and even then, like, this is just my, my personal, like, proposal. Like, this is just an idea that I have. Um, it might be better to do it another way, even. But, but this is just what I think would work out really well. So, anyway, continuing on. BWL, Blackwing Layer is in six months after release. In Retail Vanilla, I should talk about this. In Retail Vanilla, I think it was almost eight months. It was, like, seven to eight months after release that Blackwing Layer was put in. So, this is happening a little bit sooner. But you also have to account for... The fact that Ragnaros wasn't killed for, I think, 152 days. I think it was 152 days after release is whenever Rag was killed. And um, people are going to be killing Rag within two weeks, within three weeks. There, there's going to be Rag kills. So because there's going to be so many people who are just, they, they just know, people already know the content, all this stuff. Uh, I, I think it's okay to have it happen a little bit sooner than than the exact same time frame because are you trying to make an i mean it's, it's kind of the same thing right whenever you're talking about like making an authentic vanilla experience uh if you make it a little bit faster with all the knowledge and stuff that everybody has just by a little bit uh that kind of is more of an authentic experience because if you wait all the way through knowing everything you do it's kind of like you're playing the game on easy and then you have two more months to get all the mc gear before you go into bwl um i think i think six months is, is a totally fine time i think six months is great uh, and then Darkmoon Fair then as well, more world buffs, you get the damage buff and whatnot. Darkmoon Fair then, great. I don't like the concept of putting ZG in at the same time as BWL. 
I think putting ZG in at the same time as BWL is not good, and that's what they were proposing. Uh, ZG gives you the shoulder enchants. Uh, there's there's more gear that's added in there, uh, kind of as as like a cash up mechanic. There's stuff that's in there that's like better than MC gear. Or like it's it's kind of like niche items, but from the perspective of a guild leader, from the, from the perspective of a raid leader, it's n it, that's really really that's a lot to put in a new forty man raid and a new twenty man raid that everybody wants to do ZG. W one, it's fun, but two. It's something that's very, very, it's a very good raid. It's a very good raid for <clears throat> um, for the purposes of it. It's good for people that aren't quite as geared as the guys who are hardcore into BWL. But there's also stuff in there for those people. It, it, and, and this is something that, that they did so well in Vanilla WoW. Like throughout the, the entire scope of a raid, there's reason that this really like this top player wants to go and the reason why like a you know a, a scrub wants to go right like the scrub has no gear whatever he's going he's just going to take what he can get but then that really top player comes in let's say he's a warrior and he wants onslaught girdle right choker of the fire lord stuff like that uh, and i'm talking about molten core there zg kind of has the same thing going on where they need the rep they need the shoulder enchants uh the the sets in there like good kind of like mimi pvp sets the for the casters their spell hit on the blood vine <clears throat> zg is great and also it's another world buff right it's also another world buff uh so now you're you're the the world buff comes from killing hakar and you turn in the head and it's 15 percent all stats so if you're to put zg in with dark moon i mean I, I don't know i that might be too many world buffs all at once but i think having zg in like a month and a half after bwl I think that's probably a good idea. Uh, ZG a month and a half after BWL, maybe maybe even two months after BWL might be a good idea. Um, the Emerald Dragons, I think, should be paired in to ZG, to the ZG phase, and for people that kind of have time to prepare and to kill those and get nature resist gear for AQ40 and all that. Uh, but with the Emerald Dragons, I don't think it should release right at the exact same time as ZG. Like, if they can delay it a week... Or something like that i think would be a really good idea uh and i could be wrong about this i actually I, I yeah i could be wrong about this but from what i know from what i recall whenever the emerald dragons are put into the game the servers turn on and the dragons are up right so you have two big things going on zg release and emerald dragon release right at the same time i think that they should separate it somehow like maybe by a week or something like that um again by separating them a little bit more you're you're increasing the you're keeping people engaged right people are playing for a long period of time they're not getting bored because nothing's happened in however long i think all this stuff is better and and you'll see this in vanilla wow there's a lot that happens really early on and then it spreads out a little bit but the the amount of content that's put in later on kind of evens it all out right and we'll get to that here so what i would say is phase six happens a year later, a year after launch, just about, just about a year after launch. You have AQ40, AQ20. And and AQ40, AQ20 is a little bit different situation than BWL and ZG at the same time. And because you might say like, well, AQ40 and AQ20 release at the same time. Why is it that you can't release ZG and BWL at the same time? People at, at that stage, the people who are going into AQ40 day one and progressing through it, uh, are not the same people that are doing AQ20 to like a AQ20 is not really a main priority for them because uh, at that stage of the game you've really like every, everything is kind of separated out a little bit as far as like the different types of guilds and, and what guilds want to accomplish AQ40 and AQ20 at the same time is is is, is much better than ZG and BWL because you're going to want to go into ZG and, and rush through it and get all and get all your rep and get all your stuff if you're a top guild right and and I don't think I was having this conversation with uh, it was my salad bakers buddies a little bit earlier today. I don't think that you should make the game to tailor to like the one percent. I, I don't think that's that's necessarily good, uh, but I do think you should have kind of all all perspectives kind of put into to the design process and thinking about everything. And um, I do think I do think that B BWL and ZG at the same time is a different thing than AQ40 and AQ20 at the same time um, because there's just not as much that's uh, there's not as much that like like if you're like a one percenter you're like i need that like i need to go do ak20 like there's certain items in there like oh this is a nice item oh that's a nice item but um it's not like you're you're like rushing to get through it or something so 
phase six, AQ, uh, scenario circle stuff, scenario hold stuff, uh, tier 0 0.5. This is, this is something that was their idea was to put the tier 0 0.5 with the AQ 40 phase. And I actually think that this is a very good idea. Uh, in retail. Wow. The tier 0 0.5, the dungeon set two, it was put into the game in patch 1.10, which is a little bit late. Um, it's not really, it's put into the game at a time where it's like, it almost felt like an afterthought. And I think that the, I think that the gear progression and okay, going back to private server meta versus the authentic vanilla meta or, or really authentic vanilla meta is going to be different than classic meta. It just, it just is right. So like, what are you, what are you trying to strive for? Like, what are you trying to get closer to the gearing process? And this, I, I'm so sorry. My thoughts are kind of all over the place because I keep getting ideas. And I'm like, you know what? I need to touch on this and I need to touch on that, but, but level with me here. Um, I'm no script. I'm going off and I'm, I'm just, I'm just speaking. I'm just speaking from, from my brain, from my heart. Right. Um, but on private servers, a lot of the gear progression was very linear, right? People come in, like I'm, I'm talking about the one percenters again. Uh, people come in, they rush to 60, they clear MC, they rank, they rank, they rank, they rank, and they get as many people as they can to get rank 14 before BWL hits. So then they go into BWL with like a full roster of rank 14s, melee. Um, that's private server meta. That's something that didn't even exist in retail WoW. And big reason for that is because the honor system didn't exist until 1.4, right? So <clears throat> that's just an example of how the, the gear progression in on private servers seems to be very linear and in the original game it wasn't so much the gear wasn't meant to be gained that way it was it was more so like an, an alternative way to play the game in order to gear up your character uh the pvp gear is really good there's a lot of damage on the weapons but the stats on the armor is is very different right it's very stamina heavy it's more defensive it's better for pvp uh in that in that aspect but in terms of, I guess I should say subjectively better for PvP. And then there's the raiding gear, which has a little bit less stamina. You're a little bit more glass cannon. You ha you do more damage with it. So um, as opposed to like kind of having this like, let's rank. Let's rank in order to raid and to do this and to do that. And then then the, the tier 0 0.5 becomes an afterthought. Uh, I think that's not as good as, look, we have... You can do PvP and, and you can get PvP gear if that's what you want to do, if that's how you want to play the game. You can do raiding and stuff. And sure, there's some overlap and this gear will help this gear and this gear will help that gear. But it's not so much like a, a necessity for like the uh, for like the one percenters, right, to go through and do that. And uh, I, I got I got a lot of ranking buddies who I mean, they you know, it's 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 one of those things where it's like you're like, man, well, I want to rank. Right. But just just three months, three months until the rank hits. So. And I think it'll be a pretty intense rank too, to be honest, because the that rank, if BWL comes out before, or if BWL comes out three months after the honor system, then you basically have like the first grand marshals will be the first guys who get a who 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 have will be the only guys that have grand marshal weapons going into BWL if that's what they want to do. So uh, anyway, kind of kind of pulling it back. Phase six, uh, tier zero point five. I think that's a good idea to put that in with the with the AQ40 with AQ40 and 1.9 and everything. <clears throat> what I what else I also think should happen in that phase is I think the PVP gear should be updated in that phase. Uh, they updated the stats on the armor and all that to kind of make it up to par. Putting that in with the AQ40 patch I think is a great idea. This actually happened in 1.11 in the Nax patch, but um, Again, like it's it's kind of the same concept of tier zero point five. Instead of it becoming an afterthought, now it's kind of like it turns into more of like an alternative uh, way to gear your character. And uh, on private servers, they've they've historically updated the gear much earlier. So I think putting that in with the with the AQ forty patch, I, I think kind of levels it out and it makes it good. Uh, also, the dungeon gear update. So I said I was going to talk about this a little bit later. Like I, I used Heart of Warm Thalic and, and Savage Gladiator Chain and uh, some of these things as, as an example. But um, these these like Nax blues, a lot of people say like Nax patch blues. They're not. It's it's technically the patch before Nax. It's one point ten. Uh, but I think this stuff should be put in with phase six. So phase six, um, there's a lot of stuff in here, and I think it's for a lot of different types of players. 
with the Scenarian Hold stuff, with AQ40, with the Tier 0 0.5, with AQ20. Uh, PvP gear gets updated. There's, there's new dungeon gear added. That is a big patch with a lot of content in it. But I think that it fits very, very well uh, in terms of having like a, a, a good progression of the servers and pe keeping people engaged for about six months before Nax is put in. So, six months later, 18 months in, that's whenever Nax happens. That's whenever the Scourge invasion happens. Uh, I think that's a fine time frame, personally. I think I think giving you six months to, to progress through AQ40 and do all that and to get into Nax, um, I think is fine. I, I think... I mean, uh, just 1.11, just kind of leave it as is. And then I think six months after that, which would then be the 24-month mark, it'd be the two-year mark, at that point is whenever they should release a set of fresh servers or uh, maybe a Burning Crusade Classic, kind of depending on how Classic is going. Uh, they said in that interview that I talked about earlier, they said that this is something that is... Uh, they said that it's something that's on the table. So, yeah. Uh, I think that would be something very cool to see. So... <laughs> I, I I talk to I, I talk not quite as in depth not quite as in depth as, as this video but uh, I talked to that Blizzard employee that I that I had breakfast with about all this stuff and, and kind of how I, I would like to see a, a more fleshed out phased content release and uh, I think a lot of people would I think a lot of people would like to see a more fleshed out phased content release uh, it just it's better for the game it's healthier it's more fun it's more engaging I I think I think that would be uh, and again my my proposal is just an example it's not. It's not it's not the perfect way to do it, but I, I I think that this might be a good way to do it. So I just thought I would share that with you guys. And <clears throat> I didn't I didn't share the time frame with him, but I, I told him I think it should be like six or seven. And I and I kind of gave him an idea of what I said earlier. Um, next up is sharding. Now we touched on sharding a little bit before, and the sharding is something that I feel like is very very not vanilla. And a lot of people are very unhappy with it. And I asked, so so we asked Omar Gonzalez specifically. Um, this was this was on the first night or the second night, I guess, uh, the the night of the first day of BlizzCon. We we talked to Omar and we we're like, so what's the deal with sharding? Like, what's your guys' decision behind that? Like, that's something that's not vanilla. Like, what like what are you guys thinking? And he said the reason why they put sharding in was because. Imagine you take the population of the servers and then you take everybody and you put them into two zones. So sharding was something that was like, for them, it was seen as like a uh, kind of like a temporary solution for the sake of the demo. And they're still actively trying to figure out a solution for, um, they're still trying to actively figure out uh, a solution. Maybe they're, they're trying to figure out, they're trying to weigh all their options, I guess I should say. Kind of, I'm, I'm trying to summarize like what he said, but uh, they're, they're still trying to weigh all their options and, you know, this has been like confirmed by multiple people. I mean, I think it was Brian that said it in the interview. Um, it, it's been said multiple times that as far as sharding goes, they're still trying to weigh all their options. They're trying to find out the best way to do it, whether that means dynamic respawns, which that has its own huge set of problems. I actually had Nano. Nano from Nostalrius was was hanging out with me on stream the other day. And uh, like Nano says, he thinks dynamic respawns is actually worse because dynamic respawns causes like a whole slew of problems. So it's like, okay, well... We'll see if they can figure that out, maybe, if, if they think that's better uh, or, or anything else. Maybe just, like, adjusting the population size, like, dynamically adjusting population based on whatever is going on. Um, John Height touched on that a little bit in that uh, in that exclusive classic interview that we had, classic dev interview that we had. Again, that's on my YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, they know. They've gotten the feedback about the sharding. And... I, I mean, we, we know that they hear it, right? We know that they hear it, and they say that they're trying to figure out something that... They're trying to figure out the best option. Now, I think if the best option ends up being two days of shorting, if the best option ends up being, like, two days of shorting in Elwynn Forest and Dunmorrow and Duratar and Tears Fall Glades or whatever, that's not the end of the world to me. Like, in an ideal world, I, I don't like that. I don't want to see that. I think that's bad. But at least you can play the game, I guess. And it's, I don't know. Like, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens there. But um, there's that. I kind of I kind of gave my gave my two cents on the sharding. Um, sharding would be really bad, by the way, if, if it just stays in the game. If they keep sharding in the game and, and they, they keep using it later on. Because the problem isn't, like, level 1 to 10. 
I just want to I just want to say this. The problem isn't level one to ten. Like you, you get level. Let's talk a little bit more about sharding. Actually, okay. Sorry, I'm gonna keep going. So, what happens is, so you have a bottleneck. You have a bottleneck that happens whenever everybody creates their characters. Everybody's at level one. So that first bottleneck, everybody's at one, and you have everybody logging in for the first time, everybody playing, everybody trying to kill this mob, do this quest, whatever. If you have sharding for the first zones, the argument is, okay, well, there's still going to be a bottleneck at, like, the level 10 mark, let's say, just for the sake of ease. At the level 10 mark, whenever you leave Owen Forest and you go wherever, Westfall or you want to go to Darkshore or whatever, right? You have another bottleneck because now you have all these people who've been playing on, on shards and then all of a sudden they're out of the shard whenever they go to Westfall. Well, yes, that's true. But at least that bottleneck is bigger. And then that's that's the, the bottleneck is bigger, right? There's still a bottleneck. And the fear that a lot of people have is that, okay, well, if there's still a bottleneck, what if that means, well, people are still having trouble. Let's add another shard. Let's shard it again. For like 20 more levels worth of zones and then it's like okay sure you do that and then all of a sudden the bottleneck is it's still bigger but it, it's like where does it stop you know what i mean and uh, I, I think that's a big concern with people for sharding and on the flip side of things whenever it comes to dynamic respawns there's a lot of people who've played on private servers have seen this there's always like a small group of people who've kind of learned to take advantage of the dynamic respawns and figured out how everything works and use like private server memory to essentially like cheat the system and like i think i think the leveling record on a private server is like a full day faster than the old retail vanilla record and it's like okay well you can you can say oh people have gotten better or this and that but it wasn't because they were like the, they were fine-tuning their routes and changing this quest here and this quest there the they were leveling faster because they were leveling in groups like mass aoeing mobs down with dynamic respawns they were just instant spawning basically so I mean, it ends up like the game wasn't meant to be played that way. And I, it's, it's just basically like they, they have to go through and they have to figure out uh, what the best solution is there. So I, I just hope they figure out the right thing. <clears throat> uh, next up. Uh, Right-click reporting. This was a concern that I brought up. I brought up right-click reporting to him and I was like, look, this is something that... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people and it's just kind of like the nature of games today. And uh, I don't know, a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but I, I really do not like the right click report feature. The fact that I can just like right click somebody and then click this and then report it immediately. Um, I don't like that. I think that's good. Like people will just like spur of the moment, like rage report somebody. Uh, but but from a more like gamey standpoint in retail, wow, right now in retail, wow, right now. You can go through and if you mass report somebody, like you can squelch them for a certain amount of time. They can't invite people to raids. And in a highly competitive vanilla WoW environment, people are going to go and they're going to know who the main tank is. They're going to know who the raid leader is. They're going to know who this guy is. And they're going to go and spam report them. And this is, this is what I brought up to the Blizzard employee at breakfast. People are going to go and spam report them and then basically hinder their ability to play the game because they're competing with them. So what I was told is that if the system stays in place the way that it does, like they're going to be, and we'll see, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see if they, they fall through with this, but if the system stays in place the way that it does, they're going to be very, very keen on people abusing the report feature. And if people are abusing it, then they're just going to ban the people that are abusing it or suspend them or whatever, right? The temporary suspension, whatever, for the people that are abusing it. So if you if you start if people start getting in trouble for it, then I think that they think that it's not gonna be an issue in the long term. Uh, I still do not like it. My my personal uh, opinion, my personal like proposal would be like, look, if you want to have like the right click to report, do right click report and then make open it up and make them write a ticket. And um so they actually have to like go through the time and explain, okay, this guy did this, this guy, you know, he touched my butt or whatever. Make them do that. And then that way, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've gone to report people before and I've started typing out a report. And while I'm typing out the report, I'm kind of reflecting on what happened. And I'm like, dude, 
why is this a big deal? Why am I so upset about this? And I close it out and I walk away. I think, I think having the, the instant just kind of like impulse decision to report somebody is, is not necessarily good. So I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about League of Legends actually whenever I was talking about that. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> so there's, there's my thoughts on the right click report. Uh, I also brought up some other things on the, I think I might've brought this up in the interview with Brian. I think it was because Brian, I think it was Brian who said this. So it must've been in the, uh, in that, in that group interview session. I talked about the issue right now with the battle net. Ba battle net needs slight modifications for it to, to be like vanilla friendly, if you ask me. And one of those slight modifications is being able to right click somebody from the opposing faction and add them as a friend is something that I think is not vanilla. Like that's something that's not good. It kind of, uh, it, it helps to open up a line of communication with the player, the opposing faction, uh, that you may have not already had an open line of communication with. So, <clears throat> cause people always say, well, you know, what's the deal with battle net? People have discord, people have whatever people have, you know, MSN messenger, AOL instant messenger. People say they have a bunch of stuff, right? You have discord, whatever to, to talk to people of the opposing faction. Uh, yes, you do. If you already have a line of communication established with them, I think by with Blizzard having the right click add a friend from the opposing faction thing, uh, I think that's not good. It's not particularly healthy, and I I'm hoping that they take that out of the game. They they take it out of the UI because it's it's a UI element. I'm sure they could just like pop it right out. Um, but I brought that up to him, and and they said that they're looking at some stuff like that as far as Battle.net goes, and. Um, Brian, if I'm, I think it was Brian who said this. That's something that they're that they're looking into for sure. So um, that was something that was good to hear, right? Because that's something that I know I've been critical of that in the past. Others have been critical of it. So it's good to know that, like, hey, there's there's at least some there's some ears out there, right? Um. Finally, the last one, the big one. Uh, this is the one that I think just dumps on everything else as far as like real problems goes uh it's loot trading i think loot trading is something that is you, you keep hearing me say this but like it's it's not vanilla right it's something that's not vanilla it's abusable it, it's worse than not vanilla it's abusable and it allows it there's potential to hurt the game because what you can do and and i, I talked about this a little bit earlier but let's say you have three friends in a group and they're, let's say you have a warrior, a rogue, a priest, a mage, and a hunter in a group. And you, the priest, the mage, and the, the priest, the mage, and the rogue are in a group. They're, they're friends, right? And then the warrior is the tank. Hunter is a DPS, physical DPS. You're doing Strath Baron, Cape of the Black Baron drops, uh, pre-raid Bis cloak, pre-raid best in slot, physical damage cloak, attack power, all that stuff. So who needs this thing? Who's going to roll on this thing? This Hunter's going to roll on it, and this Rogue's going to roll on it. In a normal scenario, you're going to have a 50-50% chance to win. But having loot trading in the game promotes the concept of group ninja looting. Right. And instead of you being in a group together with four other people, and this is this is very specific to the five man rating environment or five man dungeon environment. You have instead of having five people coming together, trying to trying to get through whatever they're trying to do, get through the dungeon, maybe do dungeon quest, whatever you're supposed to be together. Right. You don't have that. You end up having a situation where you have three people in your group fighting against one or two people in your group. And it turns into like a, a ninja loot fest, right? Your group ninja looting. All of a sudden, priest rolls need on Cape of the Black Baron. It's an attack power cloak. Mage rolls need, Cape of the Black Baron, attack power cloak. And then the rogue who wants it also rolls need versus the hunter who may be a pug or maybe with his friend who's a warrior, right? So it's two people. If he's a pug and then all of a sudden you have 75, three, you have three rolls versus one roll. That's a... I mean, you you have three times the chance to beat that guy for the role. Your priest friend wins it; he gives it to you. You're the rogue. Your mage friend wins it; he gives it to you. You're the rogue. If that warrior, that warrior might be like, "Hey, like, like, what the hell are you guys doing? Why are you guys all rolling need?" And then he rolls need to like back up the hunter. You see what I'm saying? So then it's then it's a sixty forty split. It just it, it's it's a bad environment. It's it's toxic. It's not good for the game. Um, 
whenever this came out, people would take advantage of this and people were doing this all the time. And I know you're playing in a world where reputation matters. I understand that. But the problem is, is having, having that sort of gameplay in there. And, and some people were saying like, oh, this is good because it promotes people playing with their friends. What? No, you're promoting little bubbles of people. Don't, don't, don't do that. You want to have people want to go play with strangers, right? The problem in, in retail WoW right now isn't that you're playing with strangers. It's that you're playing with strangers that you're not building connections with and you're not making friends with a lot of times whenever you're doing like LFR or like any sort of queue system, uh, dungeon finder, anything like that. So you don't want to make something. You don't want to put something in the game, which is going to prevent me from wanting to pug anything. I should want to go pug stuff. I, I should want to go play with other people. I, I should want to go play with new players and make new friends. Like, that's great. That's awesome. And loot trading in the five man dungeon scenario is something that's very, very, it, it, it's antithetical to the game. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and I think, so I think what they should do, uh, first off, this is what I, this is my, this is my own personal selfish opinion. I think no loot trading, take it out of the game. If you screw up and you master loot something to the wrong person, then that's on you. The onus is on you. The onus is on the players. Here's the problem. I don't think they're going to do that. I, I, I just, I don't think they're going to do that because this, something like loot trading would have never even been a thing. It would have never been a thought if they weren't like adamant about having it in or something adamant about having players have the opportunity to correct their mistakes with a GM ticket or something. And, and you accidentally loot something the wrong guy. I don't think they're going to do that. I would hope they would, but I don't think they will. So I think the best case scenario is to try and find a common ground and say, Hey, The five man dungeon scenario or like, you know, 10 man UBRS, I mean, they'll, they'll figure it out. There's got to be a way to do this. Um, and actually the conversation I had with Ian Hazakos is I brought this up to him and uh, he led me to believe that, that the not, this isn't one of those, this is one of those things that is kind of, I think this is something that they can work with. I think this is something they could work on is the loot trading stuff. So I, I, I do have hope for this. I do have hope for this that they could find a way to not have loot trading be a thing in dungeons and UBRS in, in the early stuff. But if you're in a raiding environment and you have master loot enabled, then that's the only scenario where you can do loot trading. So for the, I would say the overwhelming majority of tickets, the overwhelming majority of issues that people have with looting something to the wrong person isn't, oh, I accidentally ruled need. It's, hey, my master looter is an idiot and he accidentally gave the hunter the netherwind shoulders off of Cro-Magus. That was me. I did that, by the way. So this is coming from somebody who's made that same mistake before and I still think that like the, 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 the onus should be on the players. Like It should be my fault for that. But if they're not going to have that in, put that in specifically only for raid environment with master loot and then they can just trade it to the right person they can fix it because they don't want to have to deal with gm tickets and all this stuff okay so now the players can just fix it on their own there's probably a little bit more to that uh maybe even you can only trade it back to the master looter maybe that maybe you can only trade it back to the master looter and then the master looter has to personally hand it to the right person uh maybe there's that i don't know there's there's but there's something there i think that's something they can work with and I think this is probably the biggest thing that we got out of BlizzCon that they're gonna need to they're gonna need to work on is is the loot trading. I think the loot trading is big. I'm not as worried about sharding after talking to multiple people, multiple devs from Blizzard, and and hearing it from themselves that they are that they, they're looking at other solutions as well. That they're they're trying to they're trying to do their best. So at least we know that they hear us there. But I think loot trading and I think the proper release of phase content is very 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 important uh those are the two big ones loot trading number one and then and the face content release number two um i'm trying to think is there anything else i think that might be it guys i got really long-winded um i i didn't i didn't mean to get so long-winded i thought this was going to be like a 10 minute video i don't know how long i just talked for but i i really appreciate your guys support man if you guys haven't subbed to my channel yet uh, I, I would really, really appreciate it. If you guys 
check out my streams, twitch.tv slash svantv. I stream on Twitch. A lot of the YouTube crew, a lot of the, a lot of the OGs are coming back and, and watching on YouTube again. We've been doing the classic demo stuff. I have some other stuff planned. I'll probably still do a little bit of retail wow over the course of the next few months, but I'm actually trying to put together a like life plan for everything I want to do before classic comes out over the course of the next like six, seven months. Um, and that also includes my stream and some other things I want to do there uh, as far as like the IRL streams go, as far as j j just kind of everything in general. So again, thank you guys so much for all the support. If you haven't subbed to my channel yet, I would really appreciate it if you subbed to my channel. If you hit the like button, if you guys turn on notifications, all that stuff helps me out an absolute ton. And thanks for listening. I'll see you guys later.